case of uh, parotid swelling. Mm. 60 year old gentleman, resident of Muzawal, occupation by railway trackman, Hindu by religion, comes with chief complaint of the swelling in the front of the front and below the right ear lobe last since two and a half years. Patient was apparently all right 10 years back, then he noticed a small swelling in below and front of the right ear. Ear lobule. The swelling was initially of size 2 into 2 cm and swelling slowly progressed to size around the 5 into 5 cm over the period of last two years. Adjusted by the patient, for which he consulted the local uh, surgeons uh, and was operated in 2019. This uh, post-operative period was uneventful, wound, wound healed by the primary intention except slight facial deviation just post-operative, gradually recover over the two to three months with residual palsy. And the doctor told that the, the swelling was normal and there is no need for further treatment. But, but after the first operation, six to seven months later, he developed similar swelling which was initially a smaller size, gradually progressed in the size up to the current size. The swelling was not associated with pain and fever. Facial nerve palsy, upper weakness, such as pulling of saliva, facial deviation, and unable to close the eye. And for which he again consulted to the private hospital in 2014. He was again operated and wound was healed by the primary intention without facial nerve damage. The swelling again developed after the same site of second operation of the two and a half year back, which was initially a size two into two centimeters, swelling gradually increased to the current size of seven into five centimeters. There was no other swelling elsewhere in the body. This, uh, it was not associated with pain and fever, no increase in, uh, no increase in the size during the eating. There, there is no history of recent rapid increase in the size of the swelling, no history of during rise of temperature and weight loss and TV and TV contact. There is no history of dryness of uh, eye, mouth, and joint pain. There is no history of difficulty in the opening of mouth. No history of recent onset of facial nerve palsy. There is no history of weight loss and weight, uh, loss of appetite. No history of distant metastasis. Past history. There is no history of diabetes uh, and hypertension. There is uh, history of two times parotid surgery. Personal history, patient is in very mixed diet, uh, addiction to tobacco during last 30 years, no addiction to alcohol sm uh, smoking, bowel bladder is regular, sleep is normal, appetite is adequate, family, there is no family history, is significant. On general examination, patient See, is in the history, past history doesn't include diabetes and hypertension. Diabetes hypertension is a continuous history, once diabetic, uh, always a diabetic as well as controlled diabetes. You can control hypertension, but you can't say cured. So do not include that in past history. Now from your history, if I understand correctly, there was a surgery done, following which there was facial palsy and recurrence. Then surgery done again, more facial palsy, no facial palsy. What was then? Second. Almost same as previous, uh, no further palsy. It was already there. But what was found in the second surgery? Facial nerve was there. There's no any record of second surgery. So just a history. Yes, now patient has come again with a patient has now come with a recurrence. So this is the third time the patient has come. Okay. On general examination, my patient is conscious. See the description of a parotid swelling is usually a very short case, quick one. Mm -hmm. Although it will be the same 50 marks. So do not try to honestly talk around it. There was a swelling in and around the right ear, or below and around the right ear, whatever ear it was, right? Yes. And a smarter student would say there was a swelling in the parotid region in a second time. But since the patient gave you a history, so you are sticking to that point. Okay. We'll talk about parotid region later on. And uh, in the family history, no family history of cancers, be specific. Now in the past history, you've given two past histories. One is diabetes and hypertension, which I've corrected, and a past history of surgery. That you mentioned in treatment already. That's a continuous history. There's no past history of surgery. Because there's no past history. No? You started with the first surgery, then the second surgery, 
And then the third surgery, third time the patient has come. So it's a history of present illness only. Okay? Right. You had mentioned you will describe cervical spine with local examination. Describe how cervical spine is normal. I mean, two things are important, especially in the exam. Don't read your case. You should be able to speak without it because invariably the examiner takes the sheet. Then you'll start looking left, right, and center. Point is, you have written it. You should be able to write. Don't, don't write too much and don't read too much. That's also important. You're reading it. That's what is creating all the confusion. Now, the node is visible. This is uh, upper jugular diagastric is fine. But the term is level 2 now. We, we, do, we should describe it based on levels. And secondly, if the swelling is firm to hard in consistency, you don't look for pulsations and they don't help here. So don't bring out those points. They are not relevant. How do you palpate for the parotid duct? Uh, 
perfect they just go go to the derivative cards who will describe it No, you can just roll it. Clench your teeth and roll it against the taut masseter muscle. This is the parotid duct. So you are suggesting it has been removed last time. Otherwise, where is the duct? And then you could not see the opening also. And you described that in the intro oral examination. That's why I'm saying the opening opening would remain, no? Where do you look for the parotid duct opening? In the front of the second upper molar. In the vestibule of the second upper molar. The temporomandibular joint is all right. Masseter is involved. How did you check for masseter? First, you see the mobility of the parotid gland, both marginal and vertical direction. Then you ask the patient to pinch the heart teeth. And then check out. Where did you palpate for superficial temporal artery? Take the cursor, show me. Yeah, maybe a little higher. This you palp why did you want to palpate for superficial temporal artery? Infiltration of the facial nerve is already involved, so you could not appreciate more. But you've done some tests in your picture. Show me, show us the pictures. Okay, stay with the oral, stay with the oral picture first. What is this? Ask the patient to show a heart beat, and there is a slight deviation to the left side. What else is visible on the right side? Take your cursor down. That's nasal level. Down. Down, down, move left, left, left. No, 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 left means right. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, stay, stay, no, no, go up. Right, right, right. Right is that side. Go down. What is it? Stay there, go down. What do you see? Fan sign. Fan sign. What is fan sign? When it is infiltrated, otherwise if you do it, you will also get this fan. <coughs> because platysma, the patient is grimacing, and so it's got a grimace sign. So platysma is normal. What is the nerve supply of platysma? Let him answer. What is the blood supply of platysma? Facial. That is why it's supplied by facial nerve and facial artery. It's a muscle of facial expression. And this is an expression. So facial is, the cervical branch of facial nerve is normal. <coughs> Angle is also not grossly deviated. Nasolabial fold is intact. Then how did you look for the eye? Did you look for the, what are the branches of facial nerve? Two trunks. What are the trunks? Two trunks. One is the cervical trunk. Cervical facial. One is the temporal facial. Temporal is zygomatic. So temporal is zygomatic and cervical facial. And then they divide into further two. So there are five branches. So the ramus mandibularis comes from the cervical branch. No? And that is intact. So how about how did you look for the temporal zygomatic? Against resistance. So was it found to be involved? Yeah, in this case, we are asking. Not able to open. So it is involved. So it is not involved. Huh? So what is your move? Move further. 
come to the diagnosis now. How old is he? 56 so 56 year old gentleman with right sided parotid swelling, probably malignant. Now you can explain on account of facial palsy and cervical lymph node enlargement. It's a recurrent swelling. So three features, recurrence, facial lymph involvement and cervical lymph node. They make it into a malignant swelling. Correct? Right. Now, any, any question? I'm not trying to rush it through. It's just that he was reading, so it took me a little while to understand. How do you proceed? CT is indicated in recurrent swellings, suspected malignancy, and skull base involvement. Deep lobe is not involved, but there is a doubt of facial nerve involvement, so you would like to go for CT scan. That's all right. But before that, you will do an FNIC with ultrasound guidance, and that would decide many other investigations. You should answer this way. And second thing is, when you are describing the swelling, you did not mention uh, the way. It's very easy to describe it. There is a 4 to 3 centimeter swelling lying in the parotid region. What are the boundaries of parotid region? Next. You're answering? There are two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. The horizontal line is the upper horizontal line and the geogometric bone and the lower horizontal line the angle of the mandible. Okay. Vertical? Or the master region. And the other is the midpoint of the zygomatic process. The square is a parotid region. Any swelling in the parotid region is a parotid swelling unless proved otherwise. That is the reason. So there is a swelling in the parotid region, then you get a question, what is the parotid region? That's why you should describe it. And then describe the swelling. And don't come out with useless points which are not relevant. It's not a cystic swelling. Why should it be pulsatile? Especially when it is not, describing it at length is no point. Okay, you've done an FNAC, you've done a CT, and facial nerve is partially involved. It looks all right. What treatment will you offer? What is that called? Total conservative parotidectomy. And what do you do for the lymph nodes? It is a positive node, so you do modify radical length dissection. If it is negative, you can do a selective neck dissection, which can be not supramohyoid because you don't need level 1 here. So it will be posterior lateral as they call it. The term is changed now. Therefore, now classification is selective neck dissection. Now my new book I have given that. Older one has the neck dissection book I am talking about. Level 1 is not done. So 2, 3, 4, 5. So, posterior lateral. So that is, rather than calling it anterior lateral, posterior lateral, they call it SND and they mention the levels and the preservation of the structures. <coughs> there will be skin loss and you may have to reconstruct using a forehead or a, you can, since the superficial temporal artery may get involved, occipital or TP flap, some deltopectoral flap you've heard of? Based on, it is based on which vessel? <laughs> So right now, dentopectoral flap is based on thoracodorsal artery. And cut it three times. It is wrong three times. Thoracodorsal cannot 
supply. It's like a dorsal is less much dorsal flap. It's so posterior. You should be, how can you be so grossly wrong? Deltopectoral flap is based on perforators of internal memory. Pectoralis major myocutaneous flap is based on pectoral branch of thoracochromial artery. And lexmus dorsi flap is based on thoracodorsal artery. First branch of x ray artery, one, first part gives one branch, superior thoracic. Second part gives two branches, thoracochromial and lateral thoracic. Thoracochromial gives of this pectoral branch which you need. Third part gives of three branches, so first, second, two, one, two, three. And third part gives three branches there, and deep posterior circumflex humeral and thoracodorsal artery, which again is used for a flap. So it's such a useful artery. Followed by radiation, maybe. And if you find that facial nerve is involved, you'll do a radical peritonectomy. What is radical peritonectomy? Total, all, both the lobes along with facial nerve, along with end block dissection. Any questions? MRI is superior, but uh, CT has an advantage for skull base assessment. CT has an advantage for skull base assessment. MRI is superior for facial nerve assessment. But CT gives you adequate information for facial nerve also. So most people like to do a CT. The indications for CT scan in parotid malignancies are very clear. Recurrent, remnant, parotid cancer, skull base, when you have a doubt, and third is facial nerve involvement. So you would like to do that in this case. Yes? You're asking? Same question. Same question. You can write both because in US, uh, CT they do as a first investigation in most situations. While we don't do CT that frequently. Yeah. And the role of, uh, uh, if you're interested, please watch uh, my video on YouTube on uh, deep lobe parotid, which is based on the rubber slings that we use to dig out the deep lobe. That is the procedure we use for this. And I have also got a video of total radical parotidectomy with neck dissection. Both are there. So neck dissection when you're doing, you can use the same incision. What incision is used for parotidectomy? Modified Blair's incision, which looks like a lazy ass starting in front of the triggers, going down behind the ear and getting down at least two centimeters below the mandible because you preserve the ramus mandibularis. And then this extension into the neck can help you do the neck dissection. That is the reason. And with that, you can easily reflect both sides and finish it. Any other? Any, and most of them require adjuvant radiation, so there is no confusion about it. Don't forget to examine in any neck swelling. I'm concluding. Scalp, oral cavity, and cervical spine. Which he did, barring the cervical spine. Which also he did. Cervical spine because the metastasis could be, the, could be going to cervical spine or the primary in cervical spine can manifest like disease of the cervical spine can manifest in the front of the neck. Okay. Now, with that we can call it a day. The uh, parotid fascia is the basis because the Investing layer ends here, and then parotid fascia, two leaves emerge. That's why parotid abscess is a very painful condition, you know, tight compartment. So when you open the mouth, the fascia gets stretched, so the swelling reduces in size. The pratisma test is also similar. Deep fascia test is like this. If you turn the head that way, the deep fascia becomes taut. So the swellings of the posterior triangle disappear. These are all, parotid is there, you know. Parotid doesn't need too much of rocketing.